Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first Grand Rounds for 2022. Uh, delighted to have you with us and uh, thrilled, as I've mentioned a couple of times this year, whenever we can have an alum of our program come back to give Grand Rounds. Um, and today we are particularly excited to welcome Naoka Murakami, um, who was a resident here. Um, before that, had gotten her MD and PhD at the University of Tokyo, then went up to uh, to Boston, uh, where she did a, a Brigham and Women's and Mass General Joint Nephrology Fellowship and Transplant Nephrology Fellowship. And she's now a transplant nephrologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She's uh, done a bunch of interesting research and has been funded by the NIH and the American Society of Nephrology. And so today she joins us to talk about onco nephrology updates. Dr. Murakami, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiseman and Dr. Mitaka for the kind, uh, kind introduction. And then I'm, it's a great honor to be here. Um, as Dr. Wiseman mentioned, I was a resident three, uh, seven, eight years ago, and I was, you know, sitting and listening to the ground round. So it's very, very amazing here. So um, today I'm going to talk about onconephrology update uh, with the focus on immune checkpoint inhibitors and a kidney injury. All right, I have nothing to disclose. So today's learning objectives include uh, number one, to understand the kidney disease burden in a patient with cancer, and number two, to learn clinical characteristics of immune checkpoint inhibitor associated kidney injury. So first I'm gonna talk about, you know, um, do some introduction, what is onconephrology and why it's so important. So what is onconephrology? Probably you might not heard about it before, but this is the emerging field in nephrology in the intersection between nephrology and oncology. Uh, we're here to help diagnose and manage cancer associated or cancer therapy associated kidney diseases. So why onconephrology is so important? And it, you know, this is also related with why I'm giving a talk to medical residents, um, uh, not to the nephrologist. Uh, to, it, the, the reason is you know, to uh, let you understand, uh, I'd like you to understand the burden of kidney disease in patients with a cancer. So in the, the, the upper half that highlights the burden of cancer. So nearly 1.8 million people are newly diagnosed with cancer in the United States. And it's estimated that 17 million cancer survivors in the United States, and it is projected to increase to 22 million in 10 years. And then national expenditure for the kidney uh, cancer care is about $150 billion, which is a lot of money. And if you turn to our, turn our focus to the kidney uh, side of this uh, entity, the risk of acute kidney injury is 25% within five years after cancer diagnosis, and the risk of CKD um, stage three of above is 15 to 40% in this population. And then uh, moreover, risk of death in kidney survivors with stage three or four uh, CKD is 15 to 27% higher than those with pre preserved GFR. So this is a lot of burden of the kidney disease in the patient with a cancer care, a cancer um, history. And it is important to, it's very, very important to know this um, knowledge. So let's talk a little bit about the acute kidney injury in the patients with the cancer. So today I'm going to, you know, um, talk about several cases to highlight our points in the talk. So first case is about a 66 year old woman with a history of stage four colon cancer was started with a full Fox and the bevacizumab, which is anti-VGF um, antibody. Two months later, she developed uh, hypertension, with a 170 over 80 millimeter mercury, which is new for her. And her urinalysis showed a three plus protein and a one plus blood, which is also new for her. Oncologist started a lot of pain, but blood pressure remains elevated. So she didn't have any history of kidney disease or hypertension. Medication include a lot of pain, five milligram daily, which is, um, was started two or three weeks ago. It, exams are benign, no peripheral edema, Laboratory shows elevated creatinine 2.6 or uh, from 1.0 milligram for the baseline. Electrolytes liver functions are normal. CBC showed a uh, white cells of 10, hemoglobin 9.8, platelet 98. LDH is mildly elevated and haptoglobin was low. Urine protein creatinine showed a nephrotic range between urea of 3.8 gram per gram creatinine. So what is the most likely diagnosis of the AKI and proteinuria? 
A, pre-renal, volume depletion, B, membranous nephropathy, you know, cancer-related maybe, C, thrombotic microangiopathy, TMA, or tumor lysis syndrome, or E, post-renal obstruction. So differential diagnosis of AKI in the uh, patients with cancer uh, follows this uh, very famous framework of uh, pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal. This framework work is uh, still useful in this population. First, we should think about you know, pre-renal causes, which are the most common etiology of AKI in patients with cancer. Volume depletion, pro PO intake, GI loss from diarrhea can cause AKI. And sepsis, you should remember that patients with cancer are immunocompromised, so they're susceptible for the infections. And then cancer-related hypercalcemia can cause uh, a vasoconstriction and then contribute to pre-renal AKI. And then other medications such as diuretics, contrast, or NSAIDs can cause pre-renal AKI. And next, we should not, re um, we should not uh, skip the post-renal causes, obstructive uropathy, uh, especially for the patients with a pelvic um, metastasis and lymph node uh, uh, swelling can have a bilateral urethral obstruction and have a, a post renal AKI. After um, ruling out these two main categories, we should think about intrinsic renal causes. Uh, we should think about three different components of the kidney parenchyma. One is glomerular, number two, tubal interstitial, and then lastly, vascular component. Glomerular nephritis can still happen in a patient with the cancer. And then tubular interstitial component, uh, they can have acute interstitial nephritis from drugs, acute tubular necrosis from necrotoxic cancer therapy. And if they have uh, multiple myeloma, they can have light chain calcium nephropathy. And um, in the rare cases, uh, the tumor can invade to uh, kidneys and then cause uh, um, inter intrinsic renal AKI uh, in a, such as uh, chronic lymphoma and leukemia. And if the patient has a uh, high tumor burden, such as acute uh, myeloma lymphoma, then tumor lysis syndrome is uh, common after starting chemotherapy. Lastly, we should think about vascular causes, um, such as somatic microangiopathy and then renal vein thrombosis, we should, uh, we're going to talk about next. So thrombotic microangiopathy, TMA, is very important uh, complication from BGF inhibitors such as uh, bevacizumab, and then uh, medical residents should know um, this complication. On the left side, um, this is the electron microscope of the healthy kidney with a urine side on the top and then blood side on the bottom. You can see nicely interdigitating um, foot process of the podocytes. Um, and then on the left, uh, on the lower side, you see the nicely fenestrated um, uh, endothelial cells uh, lining in the basement membrane of the granulus. So podocytes produce uh, VGF, and then this is very important um, growth factor for both podocytes and um, endothelial cells. And this is uh, necessary to maintain the health of the kidney. And uh, if you biopsy the, the patient, as you can see her on the, on the right top, you can see the, the evidence of endothelial injury, endothelial cell swelling, and mesangiolysis. And if you look at the end, uh, electron microscope, you can see the effacement of the, uh, the podocytes. And this is a clear evidence of the podocyte and the endothelial injury. So clinical characteristics of the TMA is hypertension, proteinuria, and some evidence of hemolysis. You should look for um, elevated LDH and then haptoglobin consumption. And sometimes you see the peripheral cystocytes. Mechanism of polycyte injury and endothelial injury due to BGF inhibition is uh, this nicely summarized in the New England Journal uh, review paper here. So in a normal state, polycyte uh, produce BGF and uh, it nourish the podocyte itself, as well as the uh, endothelial cells lining in the basement membrane. If this BGF uh, signaling is blocked by bevacizumab administration or BGF knockout in animals, uh, endothelial cells fail to maintain this healthy condition and uh, will um, lead to 
thrombocytic uh, microangiopa CTMA. Okay, so let's move on to the immune checkpoint locate and acute kidney injury. So this is in the case number two, 72 year old woman with a uh, stage four lung adenocalcinoma with a uh, KRAS mutation. She was non-smoker. She was started cancer directive therapy with a carboplatin, pemetrexed, and the pembrolizumab, which is anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, is uh, also a, a immune checkpoint inhibitor. After three doses, um, restaging PET scan showed a significant improvement, which is great. However, four months after initiation of checkpoint blockade, routine lab showed elevated creatinine 4.8 from baseline 0 0.8. Her medical history includes GERD, hypothyroidism, and hypolipidemia. And medications include um, omeprazole, levothyroxine, and rosuvastatin. Exams benign, again, no periphery edema. Laboratory shows uh, creatinine 4.8, mild hypokalemia, and an, uh, metabolic acidosis. Liver function is normal. CBC showed um, normal white cells, a little bit of anemia, and normal platelets, and elevated TSH and low T4. Your analysis showed a leukocyte est esterase and then blood, and a sediment showed a, um, a positive white cells and their red cells. Urine protein creatinine ratio was slightly elevated to 0 0.5 gram per gram creatinine. So then what is the most likely uh, diagnosis of the severe AKI in this case? So A, for renal volume depletion, B, acute tubal intestinal nephritis, C, bromella cause, maybe an MTGN, or D, post-renal obstruction. So while we're thinking about it, let's talk about the history of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so it, they have become standard of care for many cancers uh, in 2021. So it's uh, first approved for melanoma in 2011, followed by non-small lung carcinoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma, et cetera, et cetera. And then now a more than 20 cancer species got approval from the FDA. And 30 to 40% patient diagnosed with the cancer are eligible for immune checkpoint blockade. And it's now estimated that 240,000 patients um, are eligible for this drug. So now let's talk about the how it works. Essentially, immune checkpoint blockade uh, unleashed the break against the cancer immunity. So this is the figure showing how T cells get activated in secondary lymph nodes, such as uh, uh, lymphoid organs, such as lymph nodes, or the peripheral tissues, uh, such as uh, cancer site. So for the T cells to be fully activated, T cells need two signals. One is from the interaction of T cell receptor on the T cells uh, and uh, MHC and peptide molecules presented on uh, antigen presenting cells. And the signal number two consists of the co-stimulatory molecule CD28 on the T cells and CD80, 86 on the antigen presenting cells. On the peripheral tissues, T cells can also be activated by interaction between T cell receptor and MHC uh, and peptide express in the tumor cells. However, if the T cells express CTLA4 or tumor cells that serve PDL1, the T cells cannot fully activate it and they cannot elicit full anti tumor immunity. The idea of the uh, checkpoint blockade is to block this uh, inhibitory signaling, thereby, um, T cells can elicit the full immune uh, response against the tumor cells. These drugs, including ipilimumab, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, these are all um, immune checkpoint inhibitors that are approved for a cancer therapy. So it's also important to know that immune checkpoint blockade comes with a cost. So it can also cause the side effect called immune-related adverse event, IRAE. It, have to, it can uh, occur in every single organ, as you can see on the left side. The skin rash, pruritus, vitiligo is the most common side effect, and it can cause colitis, enteritis, or hepatitis, and it can be severe pneumonitis, myocarditis, or encephalitis. 
And it's also important to notice that these side effects come with a different tempo. For example, skin rash comes very early after the, starting the immune checkpoint blockade, two to four weeks, followed by colitis that comes in six to eight weeks, and then our renal um, side effect and then endocrine side effect peak around 12 to 14 weeks. So for the renal side effect, acute tubular interstitial nephritis, ATIN, is the most common renal side effect. So this is the biopsy result of the uh, checkpoint blockade associated ATIN. So you, can, you can see in the PAS staining, you see a lot of blue cells infiltrating the kidney. These are all the immune cells infiltration. If you do um, immune, uh, immunohistochemistry, you can see CD4 positive and CD8 positive lymphocytes migrating the kidney, and they're expressing cytotoxic uh, markers such as granzyme B or parforin, and there are some scattering regulatory T cells in the kidney as well. What is the prevalence of checkpoint associated AKI? So if you think about all acute kidney injuries, including you know, pre-renal, post-renal, everything, uh, single center studies show 17% had, um, of the patient had a creatinine increase greater than 1.5 fold after checkpoint blockade. But if you limit the checkpoint associated AKI to truly um, checkpoint ATIN, the prevalence is around two to 5% by this um, uh, single center on the multi-center um, study. And the frequency of the checkpoint associated AKI also differs based on the, uh, the drug or ICI that is used. The, as you can see here, CTA4 is associated with the um, ICI AKI and the two to 5%, PD1 about 2%, combination of drug is associated with a little bit higher incidence, around 5%, but it seems PDL1 is associated with a less frequent PDL um, uh, acute kidney injury in this setting. So what is the clinical characteristics of checkpoint associated AKI? Multicenter retrospective cohort study, including uh, 138 AKI cases from 26 institutions, show that AKI onset is about 14 weeks from checkpoint initiation. We should note that this is a little bit later phase, you know, 14 weeks is around three to four months. So you should be careful, you know, it's not like we start the checkpoint inhibitor and then boom, you have the AKI, it's not like that. Uh, after three, four months, you can still see the checkpoint block, uh, blockade associated AKI. And in terms of the severity, 43% uh, had stage two, which is uh, doubling of creatinine, and 57% had uh, greater than that. And 9% had a uh, um, renal replacement therapy, which is dialysis dependence after this AKI. What about the urinalysis finding? So urine dipstick um, showed uh, leukocyte esterase and then blood. They're positive in more than 50% cases. And then sediment was significant for pyuria in uh, more than 50% of patients. And then proteinuria was often present, but only a small amount, as you can see here on the right side. What about the risk factors for the checkpoint associated AKI? What kind of patients are more um, susceptible for the acute kidney injury? So this is a forest plot showing the odds ratio of acute um, kidney injury in the checkpoint treated patients. If the patients have lower EGFR to begin with, or using a proton pump inhibitor, or they're receiving the combination of checkpoint blockade therapy, such as the combination of anti-CTLA-4 plus anti-APD-1, they are more prone to have AKI after the initiation of therapy. It's also important to know that, you know, if they have uh, extra renal side effects such as rash, colitis, hepatitis, or pneumonitis, they have higher chance to have acute kidney injury also. So extra renal uh, side effect can be a hint to diagnose a checkpoint AKI. So going back to our case number two, so the onset of acute kidney injury and the history of GERD and use of PPI and also, she also uh, had a, a 
slight worsening of hypothyroidism, and then positive urinalysis all suggest towards the checkpoint associated tubular interstitial nephritis. Of course, we need to rule out the obstruction. So we did an ultrasound, which was normal, and the creatinine didn't improve after the IV fluids. So post and then pre-renal causes are ruled out. So we highly suspected um, acute tubular, uh, sorry, acute tubular interstitial nephritis, and then kidney biopsy was performed. So this is a kidney biopsy finding. So this is a lower magnification. Still see a lot of blue immune cells infiltrations. If you look at the higher power, so these are massive mononuclear cell infiltration. And if you look at the tubules, uh, there's some tubulitis that is, you know, immune cells infiltrating in the tubal area. And then there are some uh, eosinophils here and there in the interstitium. So the diagnosis of the uh, acute tubal interstitial nephritis due to checkpoint blockade is made. So the next question is, how do we treat checkpoint associated ATIN? So fortunately, checkpoint associated ATN responds very well to steroid therapy. So this is the, on the left side, you can see the renal recovery rate by um, stratified by initial AKI stage. If you look at the old comers, 64% uh, patient uh, respond to steroid therapy and her, their creatinine go back to uh, their baseline after steroid therapy. If you look at the stage one and two patients, it's you know very fortunate to see more than 70, 80 percent patients responded very well to steroid therapy. And the next question is how long we should um, treat the patient with the steroids. So this is the uh, the frequency um, of the time to recovery. So as you can see here, it takes a long time. It requires median eight, seven to eight weeks of steroid taper for the, the kidney function to fully recover. For some significant amount of patient needed to continue the steroid for 13 weeks even. So right now the recommendation is to start the prednisone one milligram per kilogram per day with a slow taper over three to four months. So the next question is, you know, how do we know whether these patients will respond to steroid or not? So again, this is a risk factor showing the higher odds of recovery or lower odds of recovery. So if they have, you know, severe AKI, they tend not to recover very well. And also if they have lung cancer or baseline EGFR, um, less than um, stage three, they tend not to recover uh, from checkpoint AKI very well. On the other hand, if they were taking the TIN uh, ATIN causing medications such as proton pump inhibitors or NSAIDs uh, antibiotics, they tend to recover a little bit better by discontinuing these causing medications. And then steroid uh, responses again, uh, very, very well. Okay, so she was treated with a prednisone with taper over three months and then her creatinine plateaued 1.6 milligram per deciliter. During this period, her CT surveillance didn't show active tumor, which is great news. However, one well, month after discontinuation of prednisone, CT showed increased hyalur mass and reinitiation of ICI was considered. So what should we do? Should we consider rechallenge with the checkpoint inhibitor? Should we, I mean, do we expect uh, the AKI to recur? So in order to you know, answer this question, we did some uh, anal analysis, what happened after uh, re-challenge with the uh, ICI. So the answer is very encouraging. After re-challenge, so these two, you know, 93 people with a renal recovery and then 28 with non-recovery, 83% didn't have recurrent AKI after re-challenge. So in other words, only 17 or 16% of the patient uh, had recurrent AKI, which is uh, encouraging. So in addition, um, checkpoint not only caused the acute tubular um, interstitial nephritis, but also can cause uh, glomerular nephritis. The cases are st still uh, scant. So this uh, care report um, did a systemic uh, meta-analysis 
showing like uh, faulty immune granulonephritis is the most common, followed by photocytopathy and NC3GN, but more information to, uh, is needed to analyze further. It also causes acid base and electrolytes abnormality with the hyponatremia, most common with the uh, proposed uh, mechanism of SIADH or hypophysiasis, and then uh, hypokalemia, 27%. And in some reports, this uh, RTA can happen after a checkpoint inhibitor, but uh, this is very rare. So then lastly, then I'm going to move on to the checkpoint inhibitor and then transplant rejection. So this is the last case um, in our talk, 58 year old woman, status post kidney transplant 24 years ago for reflux uropathy, recently started treatment for metastatic melanoma. She presented to clinic with a decreased urine output and hematuria. So it means um, kidney transplant patients need to take immunosuppression for lifelong. And um, she was only on a prednisone um, because of the, the history of the cancer. Our medication list include cavelilol, omeprazole, uh, these two immune check checkpoint blockade, anti-CPL4 and then anti-PD-1, which was started three weeks ago. A creatinine was elevated 3.4 milligram from baseline 1.2, and then urine protein creatinine ratio was 1.0. Urine analysis showed one plus protein, one plus blood, two plus leukocyte esterase, and the sediment was very, very active, and the kidney biopsy was performed. So what is the most likely kidney lesion that will be seen in this patient? Acute rejection, was some virus nephropathy, or membranous nephropathy or metastasis of melanoma to the kidney allograft. So we're going to talk about the acute rejection in the checkpoint blockade. Before that, I'd like to review, you know, the, the cancer burden in the kidney transplant patients. So malignancy is a major cause of death after kidney transplantation. As you can see here on the left side, this is the, the cause of death in dialysis population. The cardiovascular death uh, consists of um, explain that uh, 49% of the patient deaths. On the other hand, malignancy is the third leading cause in the transplant population followed by um, following the cardiovascular and the infection. So thankfully, you know, with a great uh, improvement in the diagnostic and therapeutics, cardiovascular death in the transplant population decreased significantly over the past 20 years. The same for the infectious cause of death. However, the deaths due to malignancy didn't decline over time. So this is uh, a graph showing the uh, cancer incidence, comparing the, uh, the, the patients with the uh, CKD stage four or being on dialysis or the pulse transplant in the different cancer species, including sarcoma, non-melanoma skin cancer, lymphoma, kidney, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see here, post-transplant population had a much higher incidence of cancer uh, in almost all um, kin cancer species. So this is a very big problem in the uh, kidney transplant population. In addition, immune check, uh, using the immune checkpoint blockade in the kidney transplant patients is very, very complex. So in a non-transplant po population, we should think about you know, checkpoint blockade um, administration and a tumor response and maybe you should think about, you know, 2 to 3% of the uh, tubular interstitial nephritis. But in the kidney transplant patients, we should also think about the immunosuppression they are taking. How do we, you know, modify or should we modify this immunosuppression? Or we should also think about the kidney allograft rejection. So it's very complex. So what did we know so far? In terms of the safety, ipilimumab anti-CTL4 was initially shown uh, to have no rejection. But two years later, there's a case report that nivolumab anti-PD-1 uh, promote the transplant rejection. So the transplant field was very, very curious at the time uh, what would happen next. And later, pooled case series and metal analysis showed a rate of acute rejection is very high, 30 to 40%. Uh, but the association between rejection episode and overall survival was unclear. 
In terms of the efficacy, no study has tested the clinical efficacy of the checkpoint blockade in the kidney transplant population because these people are um, patients are um, excluded from the clinical trial of these drugs. So we um, recently conducted a, a multi-center observational studies um, collecting almost 70 cases from 23 institutions around the world and uh, analyze the clinical characteristics of acute rejection in this population. Out of 70 or 69 patients, 29 patients uh, experienced acute rejection, unfortunately. We learned that checkpoint in initiation to rejection is very, very quick, 24 days, it's almost three weeks. And when it happened, type of the rejection is a mixture of uh, T-cell mediated rejection and antibody mediated rejection. And unfortunately, once rejection happens, 65% of the patient lost the allograft and it needed to return to dialysis. What was the uh, risk factor of the acute rejection? What kind of patients are tend to reject? We didn't find um, you know, uh, the actually higher risk of rejection, but we found a couple of uh, lower risk, um, the, the variables that is associated with the lower risk of rejection. One is the mTOR inhibitor use. So the kidney transplant patients are taking um, immunosuppression, mTOR inhibitor, sevolimus or everolimus are one of the uh, uh, immune suppression reagents. If they take these um, reagents, they might be uh, at the lower risk of rejection. Similarly, if they are on the three agent immune suppressions, for example, the combination of a steroid, uh, calcineur inhibitor, and the anti-metabolites, they tend not to reject, which is good, in, good, good information. Also, we did an efficacy study of the checkpoint blockade in the skin um, cell carcinoma. So we compared the overall survival of these patients um, with those uh, who were receiving the checkpoint blockade, showing blue, and then those who didn't receive the checkpoint blockade. As you can see here, if you treat the patients with a checkpoint blockade, their overall survival might be a little bit longer, uh, but we need to test in a larger population. And then, you know, if the patients are experiencing rejection 30 to 40 percent, the next question is, can we mitigate rejection or can we prevent it? Can we do anything about it? So this is very interesting study published in 2017, um, suggesting, you know, a little bit of prednisone pulse during the time of the checkpoint blockade administration might be able to prevent acute rejection. And uh, right now, a clinical trial is ongoing to test this uh, regimen in the transplant patient. So we uh, will learn more from this. So, okay, so to summarize the clinical characteristics of the checkpoint associated AKI, so this is really a key slide um, that I wanted to share with you. So kidney transplant patients has very high risk, high risk of uh, AKI, 30 to 40% patients uh, experience acute rejection compared to 2-3% in the non-transplant patients. The rejection is very quick, about three weeks after starting the therapy versus 16 weeks in the non-transplant patients. Histology is pretty similar. Both showed a non-mononuclear cell infiltration, and, uh, but the steroid therapy response is very different. Kidney transplant patients are very, very refractory to the therapy versus non-transplant patients um, respond very well and then 85% of patients achieved the full recovery. And the risk factor includes um, the mTOR inhibitor and then three agent immunosuppression, which is associated with a lower risk actually in the transplant patients and the non-transplant patients, uh, lower baseline kidney function and then uh, PPI use was associated with a higher risk of uh, AKI. So in the next um, two or three minutes, I'm going to touch a little bit on a mechanism of checkpoint associated AKI and transplant rejection. So we don't know, you know, actual mechanism of the checkpoint blockade associated AKI, but we're trying to address that by doing a gene expression analysis and the kidney biopsies. So we collected, you know, 75% um, archival kidney biopsies and did a gene expression analysis trying to find 
the characteristics of acute kidney injury in the checkpoint blockade and then try to see, you know, what's different from the conventional drug-induced acute intestinal nephritis. So this is, you know, the uh, big picture summary of gene expression analysis showing how similar or different uh, transcriptional um, uh, signatures are between these different uh, category of disease. So as you can see here in this normal in gray dots here, um, conventional drug-induced AIN, which is the acute intestinal nephritis uh, caused by proton pump inhibitors or uh, antibiotics showing uh, green, which is totally different from normal, which is expected. And this is conventional T cell mediated re uh, rejection in the kidney transplant patient. This is also somewhat different from the drug AIN, which is kind of expected. And then now if you compare the gene expression pattern of the checkpoint associated acute interstitial nephritis, it seems more similar with a drug-induced AIN, which is new, but kind of expected. More interestingly, checkpoint-associated T-semediate rejection is actually transcriptionally more similar to the drug-induced AIN rather than the conventional T-semediate rejection, which uh, we don't know yet why, but this is a new finding and then more study is needed. Okay, so to conclude, um, onconephrology is an emerging field of nephrology to care for the patients with the cancer. And the patients with cancer are at the high risk of AKI and CKD. And the checkpoint blockade can cause acute kidney injury and the transplant rejection. And further mechanistic studies of uh, acute uh, kidney injury and rejection due to checkpoint blockade is needed. And then we recently you know, launched the American Society of Onconephrology so if you are uh, interested, please visit this um, website to learn more about onconephrology. So I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Checkpoint Blockade Kidney Transplant Consortium, uh, which uh, helped a lot and then cannot, couldn't do a multi-center study without uh, all the people from these institutions. And also I'd like to thank the colleague at the Brigham and MGH and pathology at the Brigham at, as well as at the University of Alberta, Canada, and uh, my colleagues at Dana Farber Oncology. And uh, also I'd like to thank um, the patients and family with the kidney disease, kidney and the um, cancer uh, who were the inspiration of our study and uh, they really uh, uh, pushed the, the field forward. Thank you so much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Murakami. Uh, looks like uh, we'll open the floor to questions if people want to unmute or enter them in the chat. It looks like there's one question in the chat already, if you want to lead off with that. Uh, looks like uh, there is one question coming from audience um, from uh, Matsuo, Yu, and Hiroki. Um, what particular immunosuppressants have higher tumor genetic? That's a great question. Um, so it depends on, you know, what kind of uh, the type of the cancer you think about, but uh, the non-melanoma skin cancer is associated with, uh, um, with uh, use of, actually the mTOR emitter is uh, known to prevent the, uh, the non-melanoma skin cancer. So if you, have a patient who has a history of no melanoma skin cancer with a kidney transplant, it's recommended to switch the immunosuppression uh, to the mTOR inhibitor, or it's like uh, sirolimus or virulimus to, uh, to secondary prevent the skin cancer. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I have a question. Oh, Dr. Harvard, go ahead. Sorry to, uh, to butt in there. Um, good to see you doing very well. Now, it's good to see you doing some nice uh, research. Um, quick question about the very one of the very last slides you showed about the transcriptional overlap between uh, 
ICI um, uh, Q rejection and the and uh, the I, I, I want to make sure I get it right. The drug, the similarity to drug induced um, AIN, or is it unsimilar to drug induced, more like Q rejection? Can you can you review that again for us? Yeah. So let me um, share the screen again so that. Um, Here. Okay. You do this. So, right. So, so it's the uh, the transcription analysis showed uh, the similarity between a checkpoint AIN and drug induced AIN here. So, red circle kind of overlaps with the uh, drug induced AIN and blue, oh, is it, sorry, green. It's a little bit different from a conventional T cell mediated rejection. This blue circle is nothing to do with the checkpoint. This is, you know, um, the usual non ICI associated um, T cell mediated rejection. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, also surprising to us, you know, as I mentioned, you know, checkpoint associated T cell mediated rejection is overlapping more with drug induced AIN rather than a T cell mediated rejection. So we're wondering if this is, you know, really this based on the histology and uh, the uh, clinical history, these are categorized as T cell mediated rejection, but maybe T cell uh, reactivity might be against something else rather than graft itself. You need to study a little bit more, uh, for example, T cell um, receptor specificity and so on to answer that question. I think it's, that's very interesting uh, from my point of view. If you're, if you're defining rejection by biopsy criteria of infiltration of lymphocytes, you know, you may, you, it, it's not as specific as what you're showing here. So excellent. Very cool. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we thought. You know, we we're looking at three to so actually uh, ask the pathologist a question showing three um, HN, HNE staining of the kidney biopsy. Can you tell which one is which, you know, drug induced versus checkpoint induced or um, t cell mediated rejection in the transplant patients? And they cannot really tell, you know, the histology is exactly the same. You know, without the clinical context, you cannot really diagnose um, the uh, interstitial nephritis versus um, rejection. So I think, you know, these type of transcriptional analysis or T-cell, uh, more deeper analysis of T-cell specificity might give us more idea of what exactly is going on. Very nice. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, Dr. Murakami, related to that like question around like gene expressions, um, do you see the future where like uh, nephrologists or oncologists like uh, check like gene profile, like genetic backgrounds before starting uh, immune checking point inhibitors so that like uh, uh, we can exclude like high risk people for like autoimmune, like uh, complications of like immune checkpoint inhibitors before, yeah, for um, patient with malignancies? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And uh, it's a million dollar question. And then I think uh, all the people um, that are working with uh, checkpoint blockade really want to know. And uh, for now, I think it's um, a little bit tough to predict who will be um, having higher risk of these immune related adverse events. But uh, Definitely there's a, you know, biomarker studies going on. Um, then uh, some studies suggest, you know, some cytokine might be important even pre-initiation of a checkpoint blockade. So I think it's um, important to uh, study this population in a, you know, um, in a not the retrospectively, but uh, prospectively.
and collecting samples and look into them. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions, comments from the audience? <clears throat> Um, All right, I think we did it. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us. Always good to see a familiar face. Thank you everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon.